I was born in Merseyside, very close to Liverpool, and I'm a Liverpool Football Club supporter. Um, as a child, I was very interested in natural history. I started with botany and joined uh, the local natural history club and then graduated to birds and insects. So when I was um, a teenager, I, I really wanted to be a, a natural historian, but uh, my parents very wisely advised me that there wasn't much in the way of career options available at that time to do that. So I was channeled through my interest in biology towards medicine. Um, when I left school, I, I got, went to the Royal London Hospital Medical School in Whitechapel, which um, is the place where James Parkinson um, did some of his training before he became a, an apothecary in Hoxton. And it had a, a very great tradition of neurology, probably as much as Queen Square, in that Hewlings Jackson was uh, appointed there, Jonathan Hutchinson, who was a general physician with a great interest in um, neurology, was also there in the 19th century. And then, just before I arrived in the 60s, Lord Brain had been ruling the roost, and so that when I arrived, and the, the teachers there were Christopher Earl, who then moved to Queen Square, um, Ronnie Henson uh, and Michael Swash. There was a very strong tradition of both neurology and neuropathology, so as a medical student I became very interested uh, in neurology and it was towards the end of my medical training that I decided I wanted to uh, do neurology. Um, I then did my junior training in neurology uh, here at Queen Square at University College Hospital and I had one year at the Salpetria Hospital in Paris working with uh, Gautier and Lermite which was very extremely stimulating and uh, I recommend that most of my fellows now try and spend some time overseas. Of course many of my fellows are from overseas but the ones who are UK trained I, I encourage them to spend uh, a period looking at a different system of medicine and a different training. So that's really how I got here and then I was appointed um, as a consultant in my early 30s which was early. I was just fortunate that there was an opportunity and at that time there was nobody on the staff very interested in Parkinson's disease or movement disorders. Um, Professor Marsden uh, was working at King's College Hospital and it was a, a kind of gap here uh, with respect to special interests. So I think that was one of the reasons I, I was appointed so early. I think the environment was different then than it was now, it was more intimidating. Pe people were more formal uh, uh, in, in the way business was conducted. But I, I was made to feel uh, very at home once I became a consultant. So the transition from being a junior doctor to being a consultant was made very easy by my senior colleagues. And uh, many of them were uh, around and available to help, particularly um, William Goody, who I, I trained under, and, and Christopher Earl, who was here, and John Marshall, they, they were all great influences in, in, in my training and, and then as mentors once I'd become a junior consultant. I think of those two, I mean, I, I was involved in the early negotiations to set up a, a learned society called the Movement Disorder Society, but the driving force behind that was Stanley Farn, who's a professor of neurology at Columbia University in New York. So it was his drive, supported by David Marsden, that um, uh, really set it up. But I was in the coterie of... Um, young Turks who were roped in to, to get the thing going and of course that's been a, a phenomenal success. Um, uh, 
uh, most movement disorder specialists and our members of the Movement Disorder Society. We hold a very successful international meeting once a year and um, the Movement Disorders Journal is popular and, and very well read so it, it's, it's been a, a great success and has helped to enhance the subspeciality of, of, of movement disorders. Um, the, the Queen Square Brain Bank I, I'm much more I feel is much more something that I drove and um, the, the story behind that was that um, it, it, autopsy rates were dropping uh, very rapidly in the United Kingdom in the late 70s, early 80s, social changes and so on were happening so that whereas when I was a training as a medical student it was fairly common to have routine post-mortem examinations on patients that we'd been looking after and that was great for helping you to improve your diagnostic skills but also in teaching you humility in the you know you didn't always get it right and you could learn uh, from your mistakes it, it also taught me that people when they die often have more than one thing wrong with them so it's often very difficult to say precisely what the cause of death was. So I learnt an enormous amount from pathology as a student and neuropathology at the Royal London, uh, as with neurology, was, uh, was a very strong discipline. So I, I was always very interested in pathology. And um, when I got interested in Parkinson's disease, it seemed to me that there was uh, a great need for um, a dedicated a tissue bank to collect um, brains and spinal cords for helping us in trying to understand Parkinson's disease because there isn't a naturally occurring animal model for Parkinson's disease so we're still very dependent on um, clinico-pathological correlations and unlike multiple sclerosis for example where neuroimaging has rev revolutionized the field uh, in the neurodegenerative disorders like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, it still plays a relatively minor role in, in workup and uh, investigation. So, so those were s some of the sort of backgrounds behind setting it up. And I, I went to see Professor Marsden at King's and said that I was interested in setting up a brain bank at Queen Square and would, would he feel that this was a good idea and he was extremely supportive as uh, actually he always was with my career he always helped and supported uh, me and my ideas and so we, w we both went to the Parkinson's Disease Society of the United Kingdom to try and get a program grant to set it up and we were successful so we started uh, with the neuropathology at actually at Maida Vale Hospital, which some of the alumni, were, older alumni will remember, which was the other branch of Queen Square. And we set up neuropathology there and we did the neurochemistry down at King's College Hospital in David's department. So initially it was on split sites and then when David got the chair of neuro neurology up here at Queen Square, we joined it up and for the last 15 years it's been in Wakefield Street which is part of the Institute of Neurology and I think that's been instrumental not, not only in um, enhancing my own career as a neurologist but also providing a fantastic research resource for, for many of the alumni who will be here at this meeting and also many of my clinical fellows so it, it's been my sort of um, driver for, for research um, uh, in addition to clinical research. L largely to having very, very good uh, fellows working with me. I mean, we, we've had a, a Gerald Stern, who was another of my mentors uh, here, and I have had a, a very close link with uh, Mel, U, the University of Melbourne, Mon Monash mainly, um, uh, and we've had a series of brilliant um, Australian research fellows who've come here and done research and uh, uh, un under 
my guidance have published very high impact journals. We've also had fellows from all over the world really from almost every European country at the moment I have a, a research fellow from Russia, a research fellow from Brazil, somebody from Northern Ireland, somebody from Greece. Uh, so it's been a great pleasure for me and, and a stimulus for me working not, not only with UK trained clinical fellows but also with overseas fellows who've um, uh, as I say contributed significantly to my own curriculum vitae so um, the fact that I'm the most highly cited Parkinson's disease researcher is partly a reflection of that I've been in the business for a long time because the, the longer you've been at it the, the, the more impact you get um, uh, and, and also uh, the, the very good people and the, the milieu of Queen Square. I mean, Queen, it, many uh, regional neurological centers now don't have time to do research and we, we, we've always been very fortunate um, at Queen Square in being able to balance the academic aspects of neurology with providing very good clinical services. And, uh, I think that th those are the factors really, having good people working with you and having the right environment to be able to do uh, proper research. Well, he was a man of all seasons. He wasn't just a, a very good general practitioner. He was a very distinguished geologist and paleontologist. And although my interest in the natural world is with the living natural world, and his was much more with the organic remains of the dead world, uh, I'm sure we would find uh, things that we could talk about with that. Um, his politics were probably fairly similar to mine. He, I think if he'd been alive today he'd probably be a member of either the Liberal Party or the Green Party. Um, um, so I think we'd have shared interests in, pol in his interest in politics and social reforms to talk about. Um, I, I think if what, one thing I'd like to ask him is what, what, was there anything other than his natural curiosity uh, and uh, that, that made him write the essay of the shaking palsy. For example there's been speculation that perhaps a family member had the shaking palsy um, but I suspect it was just that he was a, an inquiring doctor who learned by writing about things as, as many of us do so one way of enhancing his education was to write up a case report and, and, and I think that's that's probably what he was doing and also to attract the anatomists of the day to try and find out the cause of the illness so I think if, if uh, that, that's what I would talk to about him about if I went back in time. Now, if he came and uh, back t to now and could talk to me now, I think he'd be um, probably very disappointed that we haven't managed to find the cause for Parkinson's disease. I think he'd still, if I described Parkinson's disease to him as I saw it now, he'd still recognize it as the disease he described in the Shoreditch streets in the, in the beginning of the 19th century. Um, and I think he'd be um, very excited about the therapeutic innovations that have happened. I mean, it, it, in his day, there was nothing really one could do effectively to treat Parkinson's disease. And now we've got the amino acid L-dopa, which is a, an incredibly effective symptomatic treatment for Parkinson's disease. We're putting pacemakers in, into the brain and infusing apomorphine into people and all of these things have made an enormous difference to the life expectancy and quality of life of people with Parkinson's. So I'm sure he'd be delighted about that. I think, first of all, Queen Square is a great place to train. Um, a lot of what you're taught here you can't find in textbooks, so I would advise people to learn as much as they can from the teachers. M much of it's been passed on by oral tradition from 
generation to generation, right back to the founding of neurology as a clinical discipline. So there are a lot of uh, bedside tips that you can learn here um, that you won't find in any textbooks. So that, that, that would be one thing, spend time on the wards, uh, listen to the teachers, but uh, I would also give them the advice that they must be their own, be a light unto themselves and that they must follow their own course in neurology and not just accept what their teachers tell them. Um, I think the, the history of neurology has been that uh, of people going out often in a left field direction and, and getting a bit of luck in finding uh, uh, a new direction to go. So I think just following the convention uh, is something that they should be discouraged from doing. So those would be the, the two tips. L listen to your teachers, learn from your teachers, but be a light unto yourself.